Okay, good morning everybody and can I welcome you to the 29th meeting of the Public Order and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could everybody round the table in the public gallery switch off any mobile devices so you don't affect the work of the committee? And can I welcome Kenny Gibson, um, who is substituting for Colin Beatty today? Welcome, Kenny. Um, first item on the agenda is taking business in private. Do we agree to take item three in private? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and let me move you on to item two, which is self-directed support. Now, we are, I understand, setting something of a parliamentary first today um, by combining two pieces of work. Um, we recently invited suggestions from stakeholders and members of the public um, for acts on which they would like um, post-legislative scrutiny undertaken, and the Social Care Self-Directed Support Act um, was suggested by a variety of different organisations. Separately, we also took evidence from Audit Scotland on its self-directed support progress report and following that meeting we agreed to combine both those pieces of work into one. Um, so I'd very much like to welcome the participants here today, thank them for coming and can I ask um, perhaps all MSPs and participants um, to start by very briefly introducing themselves and I'll start on my right both geographically and politically. That's an outrageous <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> Liam Kerr, uh, MSP for North East Scotland Region for the Scottish Conservative Party. Hello, I'm Ian Smith. I'm Policy and Public Affairs Officer at Inclusion Scotland. Uh, Inclusion Scotland is the national network organisation for disabled people's organisations in Scotland. I like Neil, MSP for Airdrie Shots, and I should probably declare an interest in that I was the Cabinet Secretary for Health at the time the SDF Act went through. Monica Lennon, MSP for Central Scotland. Jess Wade, I'm the manager at Self-Directed Support Scotland and we're a national membership organisation and our members are local disabled people's organisations helping people through their SDS journey. Uh, Bill Bowman, MSP for the North East Region. I'm Willie Coffey, SNP, MSP for Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. I'm Kenneth Gibson, MSP for Cunningham North. Kenny. Ross, I know, I'm just so excited at being here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm David Williams. I'm the Chief Officer for Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership. And I'm still Kenneth Gibson, MSP for the North. <laughs> and I'm Jackie Bailey, MSP for Dumbarton. Welcome to you all. Um, now, we indicated in advance that we would have three themes over the roundtable session because although it's a free-flowing discussion, we do want to give it a bit of structure. And the three themes we sent out to people in advance were firstly, provision of information to people seeking access to SDS. The second theme was ensuring care decisions are outcome-based and not simply resource-led. And the third was removing the barriers to successful implementation. Um, so, you know, in the course of our discussion, if you want to give examples of good practice, then feel free to do so. Um, but we were quite keen to get answers um, to some of our questions as well. So let me perhaps kick off with the first theme. Um, now, Audit Scotland pointed out in their report that people need better information on self-directed support, better information on the choices available to them. And it was clear that not everybody is given information on all four choices, nor were they aware of access to independent advice and advocacy. So I suppose the three questions I've got is, how is information currently provided? Is that, is that a reasonable picture that Audit Scotland painted? Secondly, of the, the kind of four options, are they routinely described to people? Um, and thirdly, what should happen in an ideal world? And I wonder who wants to kind of kick off. Jess. I'm happy to make a start on that one. Um, so our members are really, this is their work, um, is doing information and support around self-directed support. Um, and ideally, providing information on the four options. Um, so how is information currently provided? I think that the Audit Scotland report is, you know, really accurate in terms of what our members tell us um, and their experiences and the experiences of people who are um, who they're working with um, so it's really patchy provision so um, you know sometimes people will or often people will come to one of our member organizations and it's because a friend told them about something or because somebody that they knew mentioned something that kind of thing um, we do sometimes, some of our members have really good referral pathways from their local authorities, so you know that social workers or others will be directing people to them, but it's not consistent, so there are some organisations who are out there trying to do the work, but they're not necessarily getting um, 
referrals direct from the authority, which is where you know, that really needs to be happening. Um, and even if they are, sometimes it's because there's been a conversation and it's maybe been identified the person might be interested in um, option one, for example, and so they've been kind of directed then to that organisation, but there hasn't necessarily been the conversation exploring all the options. And so then actually when you go back and have more of that conversation, it might be that option one isn't for them, but, you know, the social worker probably didn't have the time um, maybe to discuss all of that in, in a lot of detail. Um, so, are the four options routinely being discussed? Um, it, not in every case, certainly. Um, I think there was the data and the development um, work that came out earlier in the summer as well um, that said, you know, actually SDS conversations have probably only been delivered to around 27% of people who are accessing social care. Um, so, that means everybody else hasn't um, had a conversation about the four options around SDS. Um, and again, we hear a lot from our members um, that people have only heard about it because they knew somebody or something like that. Um, or even if they ask, I mean, I was speaking to a lady um, last week who phoned up, um, who her friend had mentioned self-directed support to her. She was having a meeting with the social worker, so she said, oh, well, I'll just ask about it then. Asked the social worker, and they just said, oh, well, that's nothing to do with you. Um, and this is somebody with a funded package, you know, um, who's, who's got a budget. So, so that would have been the ideal time to talk about the options because the package in place wasn't working. Um, and instead, it just kind of got dismissed as, well, we can't be bringing extra things in now, talking about SDS, that's a separate thing. So um, they didn't get that, um, that opportunity, which, which really should have been there. Um, and I think your third question was, what should happen in an ideal world? Um, well, it's probably not surprising that I would say um, what we would like to see um, is a user-led SDS support organisation that is independent from the local authority in every local authority area. And we do have that in lots of local authorities in Scotland. So that's great news, you know, um, but we don't have it in all local authorities across Scotland. Um, and the funding isn't always consistent. And they might be funded only, um, so in some areas, they might be funded, but only to work on option one. So actually, there's a limit to how much work they can do around the other options, exploring options um, creatively, you know, thinking about moving between options, that kind of work. Um, so, but where it works, it works, you know, where it's there, it seems to work pretty well. Um, but that's what we would like to see is something that's being led by disabled people, service users who know their stuff um, and are able to support people through that journey and for everybody in Scotland to have access to that kind of independent support. Okay. Ian? Yeah, I think okay, fundamental to the successful implementation of the Act is that clients receive accurate information about the options that are available to them. The, the underlying principles of the Act, which I'm sure the, the Minister who was responsible at the time uh, uh, will, will agree is, is actually about enhancing the human rights of people who receive social care by giving them choice and control over the care that they receive. Um, that's about empowerment, and, but you can't have empowerment if you don't actually give people the information they need to be empowered. And I think too often the, the, the information, the anecdotal information we receive uh, from our members uh, at, at events is that too often social workers uh, are making the assumption about what option is the right option for an individual rather than giving the individual the information about the options available and allowing the individual to make that choice themselves. And that, in, that, that removes the choice and control from individuals about uh, the packages they get. Uh, I would echo the points that, that Jess just made. I think the, the, the implementation rate for self-directed support is woefully low, um, given that it's now a number of years since the Act went, went through in 2013. Uh, the implementation rate is still woefully low at 27%. That means roughly uh, one in five uh, well, sorry, one in four people who should be receiving SDS is currently receiving that option, even if they've been given proper choice. Three in four have not even been given the option yet, uh, and that really is not acceptable. And that is partly because they don't have the information about it. Um, there are other issues which are, uh, I think are detracting from people getting SDS, which we'll come on to in some of the later questions. But clearly, providing independent information and advice to individuals so they can make an informed choice about what option is best for them is essential if this um, act is to to fulfil its founding principles. Okay. Kenny, then David. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, uh, convener. I mean, I, 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 Jess Wade says in her evidence, you know, that she talks about a lack of accountability in local authorities. And I noticed that there's a, there's a real issue about consistency. 3%, for example, in Western Bartonshire, uh, compared to 78% in Perth and Coon Ross. Do you have concerns that the people are actually being not only they're not um, been given the choice of options, but being steered towards specific options because of perhaps 
um, the resources available would make one package more easy to deliver by a specific local authority rather than another, and that, that those options uh, might not be appropriate for the individuals concerned? Um, I, th I think Jess is probably in a better position to answer than I am in, in, in long term, but I think some of the evidence that you received in your paper from, from MECOPS and from uh, Scottish Care, for example, certainly suggests that there is a, an element of social workers saying to people, this isn't right for you. Um, you know, we know better. Um, it's not. It's not an appropriate package for you. And I think, uh, in many cases, steering people to stay on the, their current packages, on op which are effectively option three, rather than looking at whether or not an option two or, or an option one option, or even a, an option four, which seems to be virtually unused, um, which is a mix of different elements for different purposes, um, it would be more appropriate. So I think there is an element, certainly, that um, the. the the balance of power between the professionals making the assessment and the individual receiving the service has not yet shifted in the way that SDS was meant to do, um, and that balance of power is, is still with the professionals steering individuals towards certain uh, packages. Yeah, so our members would say um, certainly, and, and actually it's not even necessarily one particular option that people are being steered towards or, or away from. So, for example, a lot of our members who are working in rural areas um, have concerns that um, people are maybe being directed towards option one, a direct payment, when they don't actually want it, um, which is, you know, equally as inappropriate as directing people away from that option when they do want it. Um, and that's maybe come about because there aren't actually many service providers in an area or in some areas there are no service providers. So actually, the only way for somebody to get support in is to take responsibility and directly employ someone themselves. And that's fine whether the person wants that and whether there's the support for them to do that. That's fantastic. But if the person doesn't want that, um, you know, then that's, that's not an appropriate response either. So certainly in rural areas, that's what we are hearing of cases of people being directed towards option one when they don't want it. Um, in other areas, we hear about people being directed away from um, other options either to do with resource because... So um, we've heard of cases in local authorities where people have been, um, or where we believe that social workers have been told to encourage people towards block contracted services first and only look at alternative options after that has happened. Um, so uh, we believe that has happened in some areas. Um, so obviously that's around resource and freeing up money that's tied into block contracts. Um, and as Ian says as well, it's not always necessarily directly resource related, but more around an understanding of what option is appropriate for different people. So um, rather than exploring what somebody's uh, interested in what might suit them best, making assumptions based on, and, and probably some of that is around not having time, actually. So if workers don't have the time to have a good conversation, then there may be... Um, making assumptions around, for example, if the person sitting in front of them is an older person, then people might be more inclined to think, oh, they're less likely to want choice and control, so direct them to um, a more straightforward route that is probably what they'll go down anyway, rather than taking the time to have the full conversation, because these SDS good conversations take a long, long time to, to do well. Um, but we know that when they're done well, um, that actually the outcomes are better, you know? Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you, yeah, I think there's an awful lot of issues in, in even just that little bit of a conversation there. I, I probably want to start by uh, making a suggestion that I think that the uh, the manner in which data is collected across Scotland <coughs> might be a, a challenge. Uh, I, I'm not persuaded that uh, that data is being collected in a consistent way with the right, same questions being asked across all 32 local authorities, uh, and therefore the, the, you, that might be one of the explanations for a, 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 a diverse, diversity in relation to Western Batcher and Perth and Kinross, but I think that needs a bit of further work, and I think the, the Audit Scotland report highlighted that. Um, but it does, it does point in the direction of gen, general uh, uh, averages of 27%, for instance, that kind of uh, narrative. Um, I think... Uh, in, uh, I can't speak for uh, how 31 other local authorities have introduced uh, or implemented health and social care uh, 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 self-directed support, what, but what I can say uh, in Glasgow is that we, uh, as many around the table will uh, be aware probably, uh, introduced personalisation uh, a couple of years before the legislation came into a, uh, being, uh, and there were a number of reasons uh, for that, not least of amongst which was the uh, out, 
output from the 21st Century Review of Social Work uh, that was concluded in 2006, uh, Changing Lives document, uh, which uh, very clearly uh, outlined at that point that social work services across Scotland were not delivering services uh, anywhere near enough in a personalised way. Uh, and uh, the, the Scottish Government had, <coughs> prior to uh, the uh, drafting of the bill, uh, signalled quite clearly that its intention to bring in the self-directed support. There was uh, a significant uh, volume of lobbying, particularly from the uh, user organisation, user-led organisations and, uh, and disability organisations for uh, the implementation of something like self-directed support falling on from that uh, changing lives uh, document. Uh, so we in Glasgow uh, felt that it was a prudent, prudent and appropriate to move ahead with that, particularly as we'd been uh, one of the initial three test sites uh, for uh, the implementation of the legislation. Uh, what I can say is that we took the decision in, in the city to uh, introduce personalisation to all existing and new uh, service users who were in receipt of packages, uh, and that did create quite a, a, a stir uh, in, in the initial time because what that meant was that we were reviewing uh, individuals who had been in long receipt of uh, fairly established packages of support. Uh, our re reasoning for doing that was because we did not feel it was appropriate to have a two-tier system of assessment of need and allocation of resources. Uh, we wanted to move because we thought there were um, and believed very strongly that there was a need for equality uh, and uh, equitable access to uh, assessment and uh, allocation of resource. Uh, and so we could only we felt we could only do that uh, by way of a singular system. So. The consequence of that uh, today is that self-directed support assessments, personalisation is, is the only route to access of services uh, for, uh, for uh, people who are not in that need for a response to a crisis or an emergency uh, or to, uh, in, in, by way of uh, relatively low level support to facilitate things like uh, coming out of hospital, for instance. Uh, so people with uh, long uh, expected need levels uh, and access to self-directed support uh, right from the word go. Uh, got lots of more things to say, but we'll come back to that, I'm sure. I'm sure we will. Alex? That's David, in the light of what he said is, how does that tie in with, because in the uh, report produced by the Auditor General, uh, Glasgow is one of the lowest uh, take-ups of, it's a variation in the number of people with direct payments per 100,000 of population, and Glasgow is well, well below the national average and is one of the poorest performers on that table. So how do you reconcile that with what you said about personalisation? Uh, well, I think there's a few things there. I, I come back to the issue of data collection uh, and consistency of approach. I think there is an issue in, in, in that respect. Uh, I, um, I also think we need to be very clear that direct payment doesn't equate to self-directed support. Uh, it's been alluded to already that there are four options, uh, and therefore we need to have uh, a spread across that uh, uh, balance. I think there are issues around about um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of bureaucratic processes that are involved with uh, the take-up of direct payments, and that's an expected uh, and established uh, issue in relation to how people who receive direct payments are expected to account for that spend in line with the, ex uh, the, the agreements around about what that money should be used for, uh, the provision of receipts and so on and so forth. And certainly one of the things that uh, we are uh, striving to put in place by uh, fairly early next year is a, a kind of prepayment card, which will strip all of that out and, and take away the pressures on individuals or their carers. Uh, from having to be involved in a bureaucratic process because that's the last thing they actually want or need to be involved in. Uh, so I think those kinds of issues are also uh, prevalent in relation to uh, direct payments. Uh, and uh, and uh, what I haven't said is that uh, I think we've got it sorted in Glasgow. Uh, I think there's a continuing journey in terms of uh, 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 you know introducing uh, and ensuring uh, self-directed support legislation uh, and practice and, and the principles behind it continues to be developed. What percentage of people in Glasgow now would have self-directed support then? Uh, in, well, in terms of the the, uh, the, the across the f the the. Uh, the the four options. Yes. Um, well, and under the terms of the legislation, what, what, how does Glasgow compare? I mean, how many folk are in what would be described as self-directed support? Uh, 
Uh, well, I've got uh, pretty much all uh, individuals who um, are, are, have a learning disability or a mental health issue or physical disability but, but in the city. But the percentage of the total I, eligibility, what percentage would well, have self-directed support in terms of the legislation? Yeah. Well, the eligibility criteria is, a, is, a, is another issue that actually creates uh, some uh, requirement for uh, a, broad brush, a broad approach to the implementation of the legislation. It isn't just about if you present at... It isn't a case of presenting to social work services saying, I need uh, or want self-directed support. There are statute, uh, statutory requirements of social workers, which is around about an assessment of need, and dependent on the level of... Uh, if that need assessment identifies a need uh, for uh, care support, then the social work department or the local authority has a duty to <coughs> provide or make provision for that, uh, and that can be done in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, in relation to uh, the, the, the figures as they stand, it's about 21%. Uh, of uh, people, uh, as as far as I'm aware, uh, but as I say, we don't we don't include uh, the provision of support for older people over the age of 65 uh, in in that 21 per cent. But that doesn't mean to say that they are being excluded from self-directed support. So, so why are they not included in those figures? Uh, our ICT system. Uh, predated the introduction of the data collection systems that uh, were uh, put in place when the legislation came into effect and it would be uh, a significant level change including significant investment of resource to be able to do that. Uh, we are uh, moving to a, a phased implementation in relation to older people. Uh, we have a single uh, provider in the main of older people's home care support uh, through a, an arm's length uh, organisation in the city uh, who does most of that work uh, for us. We're expected uh, uh, as part of that uh, contract with that provider uh, that older people uh, who um, are identified as requiring a continuing service uh, are made available uh, and accessed to the four options uh, at the point of their first review uh, with uh, that care provider. Uh, that uh, is uh, fully in place. Our ability to collect that data uh, hasn't been fulfilled yet, and we are working on that uh, in, in line with the Audit Scotland report. But we expect, and we would expect, our figures to be uh, measurably improved. So, so when will you be in a position to be able to answer the question that I've just asked about <laughs> the percentage of people in Glasgow across the entire eligibility categories? In, uh, what percentage? When will you be in a position to give us? You know, when will your IT systems be up to scratch to give us an indication uh, of what the overall percentage is? Uh, I don't think it's just about our IT systems. As I said, I think there's a data collection system across uh, Scotland in relation to how SDS is, is monitored and tracked no, except, uh, in Glasgow. I accept that, but in terms of Glasgow, if I, if I were a senior councillor in Glasgow, uh, I would want to know when the IT systems are going to be able to give me the information I need. So yeah. uh, that's my question, my second question. When, yeah. when are you going to be in a position to tell us yeah, we, when you're we're, compliant with the Act? Uh, well, we believe that we are compliant with the Act. What we can't do, we do is evidence that. How do we know? Uh, well, um, well, I think that's the, the, a, a con, an ongoing and continuing uh, engagement with our arm's length uh, organisation provider to be able to give us that information so that we're able to be able to uh, and do that in a constructive and, and, and transparent so, way. So when will the IT systems be ready to be able to give you the, the an accurate detailed breakdown of what kind of support your clientele, if I can put it that way, are getting. Yeah. You've said yourself, David, that the IT systems are not up to scratch. So my question is, put very simply, when will they be up to scratch? Well, I think there's a well. The, the the blunt answer is I'm not. I, I don't know. And the reason for that is because uh, there are a number of priorities around uh, the wider business of health and social care integration, which uh, relates and equates to ICT and the connectivity between uh, all sorts of different systems. So in Glasgow, with with not just between within uh, social work departments and with uh, organisations like arms length organisations, uh, but across uh, the connectivity to whatever uh, ICT systems health provide. It's not a straightforward binary uh, kind of uh, response to say we are going to deal with that and nothing else because uh, the business of uh, health and social care is, uh, as you will appreciate, uh, very 
complex and uh, with multiple uh, demands on ensuring that we are putting things in place. Uh, we are confident that we are uh, making available uh, the four options to older people who are support supported and provided support within uh, Cordia. Uh, and uh, at this moment in time, uh, we do not have the ability to be able to uh, put that into uh, clear data and evidence, but we are assured by our ongoing uh, uh, engagement with the provider that uh, that information is being relayed to service users, that they are uh, clear about the choices that they're making, and they are making uh, the choices that they are making as a consequence of that. So, uh, so we can't evidence that. We're working on it. Can, just, uh, can I just ask a supplementary to Jace to ask if... Well, be before, you, before you do that, before you do that, I'm very conscious we've been joined by two people yeah. um, who were held up earlier. So I'm delighted to welcome um, Colin Young, who's the Senior Policy and Outcomes Officer from Alliance Scotland. Welcome, Colin. And to Eric Sutherland, who's the Senior Manager, Planning and Performance at East Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership. Now, you may have come in and seen two people talking to each other. It is, of course, a round table discussion. So I'm keen to ensure that that, that remains. And I'm now, I'm now going to bring you in, Alex, so you can ask Jess yes. Wade something. Just, just on Glasgow then, you know, from your perspective and your member's perspective, is, is Glasgow in this example uh, fulfilling the requirements of the legislation? Um, I think uh, that's a very good question. Um, I have to say, what I would have a concern about is um, what I heard you say, David, is that the arm's length organisation will be doing, carrying out at first review, giving um, older people the SDS options, offering them the options. And I would have a real concern that that isn't independent information and support because it's coming from the organisation who is currently the service provider and then asking people, do you want to... Um, continue with what we're giving you potentially I'm not saying this is exactly the words they would use but it might feel a little bit to people like do you want to carry on with us or do you want to change to something else and I'm not sure um, how easy it is for staff to be put into that position from a service provider um, in in terms of conflict of interest you know if you if you're trying to offer somebody something which means the money is going elsewhere um, and potentially affects your own job jobs jobs of colleagues the, the health of your organisation. Um, I'm not sure that's a fair position to put people in. Um, what I will say about Glasgow um, is that they do fund um, a user-led uh, independent information and support service, Glasgow Centre for Inclusive Living, and they would be a fantastic organisation to be in a really great position um, to do extra information and support. Um, they'd obviously need additional capacity to do it, um, you know, but they, I'm, and I'm sure they'd be really happy to talk about what's the best way to do this and actually is having Cordia do those kinds of um, reviews the right way or the best way, or actually are there better ways of doing it? Um, and certainly an organisation like GCIL, I'm sure, would have views on what's the best way and I'm sure would be in a good position to do it with resource. So I suppose, I, I think, hopefully that's a fair response. Yeah. Sticking with the, the provision of information to people seeking out, because I want to wrap this up before we move on to the next theme. I will bring you in in a minute, David. Um, Liam, you wanted to add something. Yes, just uh, as Jackie says, just on the information. So it, it, certainly I heard in Ian and Jess's answers earlier very much that people are being directed. And it, I got an impression of the social worker as, as gatekeeper uh, almost, which I think is a, something that we might return to later. Um, but... Can you clarify for me who currently is the onus on to provide information to users? Uh, who should the onus be on? Uh, what is that information that's being provided? Uh, and, and who could drive... If, if, if we start from a position that said it's not currently as it should be, and you tell me it should actually look like this, who would drive that change? Um, so... Uh, legislatively, um, local authorities have a responsibility to make sure that people are offered the four options. Now, as far as I'm concerned, they can, um, you know, pass that duty on to somebody who they uh, commission or contract to do that work. So, for example, an authority could say, actually, you're going to get all the information about the different options from an independent organisation if they wanted to. Um, what a lot of authorities do is um, maybe have a, an independent provider who specialises in um, option one. So, And that's historic, really. That's the history of... Um, so we have direct payments in place already, which is now option one. Um, so a lot of authorities previously, you know, would be assessing people, and if 
the issue of direct payments came up or looked like it was on the cards, looked like the person was interested, they would go off to the independent organisation and get that support, but anything else they would stay with their social worker talking them through things. Um, so a lot of our members are very keen to do the, the extra work and the kind of really early stage work um, with people thinking about their options um, and ideally working with people even pre-assessment um, but again that depends on capacity and funding so you know a lot of our members and some of them are doing that work some of them are doing that work through government funded um, uh, government funding at the moment through support in the right direction so some of them are doing that kind of really early before I've even found out if I'm eligible or not sitting down and talking about um, my options around SDS. So there's a service, for example, in Fife called SDS Options, which is funded uh, through the government at the moment, um, where people can talk about the different options um, open to them. And then if they go and exp uh, if they want to follow up on option one, actually they go elsewhere in the organisation to get that support as well. So it works like quite a smooth transition. Um, I think you said who would drive that change. Um, I think. What we're really concerned about is that with SDS, um, as with many things in Scotland, you know, there's a kind of central um, ideal or piece of legislation, what have you, and then it's up to local authorities to interpret how that's done. Um, and we would like to see something stronger coming from the government to say, actually, um, a bit more direction about what's best practice. Because I think for authorities as well, you know, we know um, that there's so little money you know, and if you have to make a decision, I think, for me, I think if, if I was working in authority, in finance, what have you, and I have to decide whether to fund um, independent support, which is kind of recommended, it's in the guidance, but, you know, can we get away without it? Or independent advocacy, which legislatively I have to make sure exists in my authority area. Well, which one am I going to fund? You know, I'm going to fund the one that I absolutely have to um, and try and get by on the other one, because that's what, that's... I mean, how else would you make decisions? Um, so I think something that puts some kind of greater weight on the need for independent support and greater clarity on what independent support is. So if the authority is doing it itself, that's not really independent. It might be separate to your social worker, but that's not really independent. It doesn't feel independent for individuals. Um, I think, was that all your questions? Yeah, um, I have a follow up. Okay. You're living so, dangerously. Very then I'll bring quickly. In David. Very quickly. Um, just, uh, I read somewhere, and I cannot put my finger on where I read it, but it was somewhere in these papers about that there's no consistency about how the local authority are collating data. And whatever it was I read s suggested that uh, some may be logging option three, option two, when actually they've delivered option three. Uh, which strikes me as, I mean, it goes back to a point that uh, Mr. Williams made about um, data capture, which is something that this committee is very concerned about. Uh, so it sounds from that that there needs to be a change. And if we accept that, then who's going to drive that change? Because it, the alternative is it, it's the local authority to say, we're not quite getting this right, which I can't imagine would happen. I plead guilty to uh, having put that into the Inclusion Scotland evidence. Um, I, I, it was. Um, our concern is that there are, there, there are two outlying authorities who seem to have a very, very large percentage of people on option two. Glasgow is one of them, North Lanarkshire is the other, compared with some of the other authorities. Um, our feeling, our, and it's, it's just a feeling, is that that seems a bit strange. Um, we can't actually understand why that is. Um, and, there's, and David might be in a position to answer for Glasgow, but the concern is that uh, option three is essentially the council provides the service. Um, as is the old practice. Option two is the council uh, manage or somebody manages the uh, payments on your behalf um, for the service you receive. And our concern is that in some cases, essentially what's happening is that people are being offered the same service as they get at present, um, but it's being said that somebody else is managing your, your, fund, your funding package for you. So in effect, it's, although it's technically option two, because somebody's managing the funding package for you, you're only really being offered what you've got under option three. We haven't got any evidence for that, because one of the things we're concerned about is there's not a, there isn't an audit trail going back to the individual to find out what they've been offered and what they're getting to see whether it actually matches what options people are being told they're getting. So we, we're, we're concerned you know, we need more um, surveys, more evidence gathered as to how the options are actually being implemented in each local authority going back to the individual packages people are receiving to find out whether they are being recorded accurately against each of the four options in, in, the, in the package. Uh, I'll, I'll bring in David and then maybe Eric from a view from East Asia. 
OK, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, if I, I'd, I'd like to come back to the Cordia issue, if that's OK. But in terms of the... the uh, having said I can't talk about any other of the other 31 local authorities, I can probably actually make a comment around about North Lanarkshire. Uh, and, and that is that, actually, as a local authority, they were uh, streets ahead of pretty much every other local authority in relation to providing a personalised uh, uh, and, uh, and choice-led approach to uh, the delivery of uh, social care. Uh, for uh, particularly people with uh, learning disabilities uh, in that local authority. And, and that was around about uh, the, the kind of emphasis on option two. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the approach and the comment that I made in relation to, uh, we took a lot of learning uh, when we implemented personalisation from what North Lanarkshire were doing. Uh, and in, in terms of the development of our own uh, programme and our own scheme, uh, and it was very clear uh, that we've what we've th that we um, needed to, to to be able to to kind of look at how uh, we afforded choice to um, uh, service users if they weren't going to go down the route of direct payments. Uh, and uh, be able to demonstrate that, and and if, and and, I, and manage that on their behalf. Again, this is not straightforward. This is a really complex environment that does involve and did involve for us uh, a uh, because we uh, put uh, pretty much uh, all of our service users through that process, a review of their existing packages of support. Uh, and if service users are very clearly going to say to us on the back of that re uh, review, uh, I have been provided with a support for uh, the last 10 years by X provider, uh, and I'm very happy with that provider, uh, and I'm going to choose under option two uh, for that provider to continue, but I don't want to manage it myself. Could you do it for me? Uh, our view is that that's a legitimate choice. Uh, and I think that's probably partly uh, in, in explanation to uh, the, the fact that we and uh, North Lanarkshire are outliers. Uh, coming back to the, co the Cordy issue, uh, home care providers are required uh, through the care inspector to review uh, their uh, service users on a, on a regular basis, twice a year. Uh, and, and there is a degree of pragmatism that's involved in, in how much... Uh, an authority can do in relation to de the delivery of uh, all of its business. Uh, so the, the approach that we've taken is that if the home care provider are required to do that anyway, uh, and uh, there is a, a, a connectivity and a, a, by way of a contract between ourselves as the social work department and uh, the arm's length organisation, uh, organis why would we have two separate reviews? Uh, one being about the home care package and the other being about uh, self-directed support. The two have to be considered in our view as the same. Now, the issue around about advocacy and independence is actually the issue of advocacy uh, and, and, and making sure that, that people are able to be properly represented at the point of their review. Uh, and do I think we've got that uh, absolutely correct in, in relation to uh, all 11,000 referrals every year that Cordia will take? Uh, I, 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 I'd have to say probably not, uh, but we work on the basis that actually most older people who receive services have got family members who will be part of their uh, review of care and support because uh, actually they're in their care, they're, they're concerned around about their family members, so want to be be involved in the decision making uh, around about provision, provision of support. So it, again, I, I understand what you're saying around, but there is a degree of pragmatism that's required in relation to how we actually are able to deliver uh, uh, services at the level uh, that we are being asked to deliver them. Okay, Monica Lennon. Just a supplementary, thanks, Jackie. Um, David, the point you made there about um, you know older people will have. Um, and we have family support and other people in their lives to sort of advocate for them. Um, my concern is about the people who don't have close family members and have that <coughs> that network. Um, and we often see it in, in casework generally where you think, thank goodness that person had family to come to us, but we're always worried about the people who are stuck at home who have no one. So I know that's been picked up in the in the Audit Scotland report about not everyone gets the choice and not everyone has that support. So um, 11,000 is a lot of people, but what does happen when people don't have people at home or people in their family to um, to speak up on their behalf and interrogate things a bit more? Yeah, well, I think that's a fair point. Um, uh, I, I, I do think, though, that we shouldn't 
uh, we shouldn't get to a point where we're making assumptions that uh, the social workers uh, in uh, across all local authorities uh, and uh, the, our provider organisations are not uh, seriously and, and uh, endeavouring to Im implement the legislation and the spirit of the legislation, which is a rights-based legislation. Uh, social workers up and down the country have a, a, a professional judgment that they have to make, which is based on uh, their uh, qualifications, their learning and their statutory responsibilities to be objective uh, and uh, non-judgmental in terms of how... They, so they, so that, And that's backed and influenced by a rights-based approach uh, in all cases. Now, uh, so I think we have to be uh, able to give a, little, a degree of credit to uh, folk to ensure that they are able to uh, actually advocate as well. It's not just independent advocates uh, who can advocate on behalf of uh, individuals who are service users. One of the core f uh, functions of social workers' jobs is to be able to advocate for people uh, in, in the delivery and, and receipt of services. Ian wanted a brief point, and then Eric, it will come to I you. I think we're kind of, uh, maybe in danger of losing one of the key points of this is that the, the point of independent information and advocacy is that these people can come in and give alternative ways in which services can be provided in a way which perhaps is the current service user or even the family or the individual um, can do because they are not necessarily aware that the outcome can be achieved by other means than the traditional service. So I think it's important that we do ensure that people have access to independent information and advice because that gives them the opportunity to explore different ways to have their support needs met. Eric, what goes on in East Ayrshire? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would agree there's a data issue for us, and that's definitely the case. Um, if we're looking at My Life, My Plan, which is our tool for, for having the conversation with people, and My Life, My Review, um, then out of the 3,500 live caseloads, 2,500 will have had that. So we're looking at you know, 66%, 70% um, have chosen that option actively um, across the options. Um, and I think we probably, at a national level, need to get better at capturing how that data is recorded. Um, more critically, we need to get better at capturing how outcomes are being realised. And that feeds into our commissioning processes, but that's probably a, for, a, for another conversation. On the option two, um, for us, option two is seen as a very real choice for people. Um, and option two has been an area of growth for us. And I think that's a healthy thing to see. Um, if we're looking at it, this time last year, we had about 129 people choosing option two. We've now got over 170, as of last Friday. Um, it's an area of growth for us, um, and I think that that's, that's a really positive thing around about the, the intention uh, and the spirit of the, the law um, there, that people are exercising their true choice around about option two. Um, we've had people move from option one to option two, for example. Um, so th I think that is part of part of the intent um, on uh, independent information and inf uh, and advice. Um, there are organisations that provide that within East Ayrshire. Uh, there's Ayrshire Independent Living Network who provide advice and support. Um, we also have Community Brokerage Network um, in East Ayrshire um, that provide a slightly different function between the professional and the individual and their families and around about um, how you shape an individual budget within the scope of that budget so that the person is uh, supported to make more creative solutions. And that's been a really positive thing for us. Um, also, um, back to the point that, that Ian was making, advocacy are in there and they're, they're um, providing uh, advice for individuals alongside um, the independent advice um, and brokerage. Um, how we've developed that is through very much a, a co-productive way of working. Our approach has been everyone together, um, which has started off with practitioners, families, the public, providers, everyone being involved in taking the SDS conversation out to communities. And that's been a really positive thing for us. When we've come back to look at documentation, reviewing our processes, looking at streamlining things, that's a then, then again been the approach that we would take, which is everyone together. Let's do it around the table. Let's all have that grown-up conversation about where we're at and, and where we want to be. Um, sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> it was very useful. It's, it's an interesting approach. It maybe contrasts with, with others. Um, Colin, I wonder whether you want to add anything about provision of information and advocacy support at this stage? Yeah, of course. And sorry for being late again. It's a, a me. Um, I think picking up on the point earlier about 
self-correct to support being intrinsically linked with personalization. I think when you look at the provision of information and how people feel about whether the information helped them to make the decision right for them. It is with people on options one and two, especially who feel that they have more autonomy over their outcomes. And it is often the case if they have the right information in the first place, they are more likely to make a decision for option one or two, which provides more autonomy and flexibility to give the outcome that they desire. And we surveyed around 100 people and looking at whether information helped people make the right choice. It was those on options three or four who were less inclined to say that the information they received helped them make their choice. And the option three people only, sorry, 40% of them said that the information didn't lead to their preferred choice. So there's a real link between how you present information and how people use it. And what I will say is it does often come down to the individual discussion between the social worker and the individual. And it was worrying from our research that 25% of people who had been made aware of STS from the social worker stated that they still didn't know anything or knew very little about self-tried support, and that's a quarter of people. So I think David's right in the a social worker's duty is to promote the needs of the individual, but I think it's very dependent upon how that information is prevent, presented as to how the person responds. I mean, I think that's, that's very useful information. It just underscores for me the need for early and independent advocacy yeah. um, but but you raised issues of kind of you know staffing there and I wonder whether that neatly leads us on to questioning from Willie Kofi. Well thanks for that Jackie yeah I mean one of the Auditor General's um, comments about uh, outcomes in particular um, which is your second theme <laughs> um, she was saying that social work staff are positive about the principles of STS of course but a significant majority of them lack the understanding or confidence about focusing on people's outcomes. And that kind of chimes with what you've just said there, Colin, in relation to information. Is there a job to be done to assist our social work services staff in, in giving them the skills that they need to, they need to acquire to do this particular job for us in terms of information gathering and potentially also um, assessing outcomes? Is it fair that we're asking our social workers to assess these outcomes? Or should it be someone else? I'd, I'd really value your your views on some of those issues. David? Uh, I think the pro there's always a job to be done uh, uh, in, in relation to um, how uh, new le uh, legislation is uh, introduced and implemented and, uh, and progressed. Uh, I think the, the issue around about assessing uh, uh, for uh, outcomes um, is a challenge. Uh, is a challenge for all of us, uh, and I don't think that's just exclusive to social workers. I think that's also uh, includes uh, provider organisations who are uh, substantially responsible for actually delivering uh, on on services. I think there are issues around about uh, the the manner in which services are uh, procured. Uh, and so, for instance, in, in Glasgow over the last couple of years, we have been moving, we have been uh, working really hard to see how we could move away from uh, the pro provision of or the procurement of services by the hour. 
uh, for instance, because that is, is an inhibitor uh, towards uh, the actual delivery of outcomes. And that is uh, about how, um, how uh, people are, are supported and enabled to get a life uh, and have a life that they wish uh, and be able to be uh, included and, 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 uh, and participate in, in, in their communities and in society in, in, in large part. And of course, that then leads you on to uh, a, 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 a bigger and broader picture that actually the delivery of, of, uh, of um, uh, support in its broadest sense uh, for people who uh, have uh, an SDS uh, uh, access uh, in terms of uh, identified need and, and provision of support to deal with that. The provision of that is, is way beyond actually what local authority social work departments uh, responsibilities are, uh, but takes in what's happening in communities and therein lies uh, the issue around about how do we engage and create that marketplace in crude terms of, of broad support, included in which will be actual care support. Uh, which is the bit that's uh, commissioned and procured by social workers. So there's a very big and broad uh, task involved in, in relation to delivering on the principles and spirit of the legislation. Just uh, in terms of... I want to, want to, to absolutely be clear about, about how, uh, how uh, the assessment process uh, progresses and how uh, outcomes are identified as part of a, what we would in Glasgow call an outcomes-based uh, uh, care plan. Uh, that's absolutely, as Eric has suggested, uh, done on a co-produced basis. It is not something that the social worker decides uh, for themselves. It has to be about, uh, and we have to be able to demonstrate and evidence very clearly that the service user and uh, their active advocates, if there are advocates in place, uh, are part of that process. Uh, because, uh, And that's the significant change I think that this legislation makes uh, as opposed to, to what historically used to happen, where it was very much a case of uh, putting in place services uh, on an inputs and outputs basis without actually looking at what is it and why is it that we're doing that. So I think the world has changed, uh, but it's a, it's a developing story uh, and it's a, a one that's not going to be uh, introduced overnight. And I think that, as I say, that's because we have got in place a, a, a fundamentally, seismically different approach to how uh, a, a need is assessed and services are provided from what has been asked of social work services over the course of the last 20, 30 years to something that is measurably different. Measurably different. That's not going to happen overnight. Colleagues? From our point of view, it's where, where that conversation starts, what is the dialogue and what's that framed around. Um, and where we've started with that is around about the talking points themes. It's about the kind of what matters to you question um, rather than what's the matter with you question. Um, and it's really supporting the workforce to have that dialogue, uh, being really clear and actually putting investment into that, making sure we're supporting people to work in that different kind of way, where you're talking about feeling safe, where you're talking about having things to do, um, where you're talking about the place that you live uh, and how suitable that is for your needs. And it's having that conversation, that dialogue. Um, and from an East Ayrshire point of view, we've put a lot of effort into making sure that the workforce was, was um, feeling confident and capable in having those kind of conversations that are slightly different from previous needs-based single shared assessment kind of discussions that folk might have had. Um, and we've also um, established a peer mentor type model um, where we've got individuals with a different skill set who get alongside workers and get alongside teams and support them to work in that different kind of way. Um, and for us, part of that's like um, recognising that there's a synergy between anticipatory care planning, self-directed support and technology-enabled care. So people are having those conversations at, at, the, at the very first point of contact, which, uh, you know, I guess it has parallels with realistic medicine and those kind of conversations. Um, part of that's not just about um, what other providers will do, but it's also about community capacity and making sure that we're maximising people's natural assets. We're having that conversation about what's important to them, who supports them, um, uh, the, and then what it is that statutory services need to do to support. So it's looking at natural assets, having the conversation with the individual, and then looking at the additional support that's required around about that, which, which is a different conversation. Ian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the self-directed support uh, principles are very much in line with the human rights approach from the United Nations Convention on Rights of Disabled People and the right to independent living, the approach which is about uh, um, providing support to people to enable them to be 
participate in society. Um, what concerns us, and perhaps the elephant in the room, is that the resources are not there to back that up. Uh, and perhaps one of the reasons why self-directed support has not been implemented as effectively as we would have liked in the, in the early days is because it, it's being implemented at a time when, in fact, the uh, criteria at which point you actually start to receive social care has been getting tighter and tighter. Uh, and in many cases, is now just critical care, life and limb support. Uh, it is not really an outcome for someone to be able to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, it's the outcome. It's what you do once you get out of bed. But unfortunately, for many people, all the support they get is how to get in, uh, get out of bed, or get put back to bed at, at night. Um, the, the amount of social care they get is that limited. Um, so until we actually start to address some of the fundamental issues about what we actually expect social care to deliver and how we fund it, um, and perhaps using the shared ambition for social care, which uh, was, was brought together by a number of uh, third sector organisations, DPOs and others, uh, and has been endorsed within the Scottish Government's disability delivery plan. Um, and so we start to address some of those fundamental issues about social care. We are not going to actually address sort of the problems with self-directed support. Um, so I would, I would urge that we, um, if we're actually going to look at the outcomes for people. <laughs> uh, happy to happy to support the committee, uh, uh, convener. Um, but until we actually start to address some of these fundamental issues uh, and actually start to look at what the outcomes people really want, which is to be part of society, to have jobs, to participate in education, to have a social life, the same as everybody else, uh, we're not actually going to solve the problems of SDS. There was a lot of nodding when you said the lack of resource. I wonder whether I could bring in David, followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, that, yes. I, I, uh, at one level, I'm not going to disagree with you in relation to the lack of resource, but we are where we are. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that uh, from uh, the, 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 the issue around about self-directed support, is, it seems to me, is that actually rather than looking at that piece of legislation in isolation, as I've suggested uh, earlier in the, in the session, we now need to begin to look at what are, the, what are the possibilities and the opportunities of the health and social care integration agenda, for instance. Uh, and and uh, there are 31 health and social care partnerships uh, 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 up and down the country, uh, delivering, uh, uh, planning, delivering uh, rece uh, the, the receipt and experience of health and social care in a fundamentally different way from uh, how they were uh, previously planned uh, and delivered. Uh, we're, we're not there as partnerships in terms of the end journey. We've heard lots of narrative about that, but uh, we have only been going uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and the key word in, in, in that title, Health and Social Care Partnership, which incidentally doesn't actually appear in the legislation, the key word of it is partnership. Uh, and that's a recognition that the integration of health and social care, which many people, probably too many, see as just being that bit of a council and that bit of a health board being brought together to do this. Actually, the partnership is so much more than that. Uh, because if you look at the membership uh, of uh, voting and non-voting members around uh, the integration joint board, you're looking at other stakeholder groups, the voluntary sector, the independent sector, service users, carers, patients, trade unions, clinicians, all who have now to work in partnership within this thing called health and social care uh, integration. And we also have partnership responsibilities beyond that through things like community planning. Uh, so what I'm saying to you is, I think, I exactly, is that actually there's a, there's a significant level of asset and resource in the wider sphere that will contribute towards uh, uh, people being able to uh, be included, involved, have a life, uh, 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 and have their aspirations met. Uh, it, it, but I think if we focus just on the actual delivery of the self-directed support, we might miss uh, the opportunities that health and social care integration can bring uh, as a consequence of that. OK, Liam Kerr then, Eric. Thank you, convener. Um, just uh, to develop something, uh, when, when I was listening to Colin Young, you, you suggested that the provision of information can go some way to delivering free, a freer choice. Uh, but we then go on to hear about this almost resource-led approach, um, and specifically something that I was very concerned with in the submission that we've had from MECOP, uh, where they cite examples of practitioners sitting across from individuals with a calculator working backwards from an indicative budget to determine what they can afford to meet their personal outcomes. Now, is that correct? Is that really what's happening? Because that would be a significant blocker to real choice, wouldn't it? Perhaps Jess. 
Oh, I, I can well believe that that would have happened, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I mean, I've heard, I've spoken to people um, over the years, you know, I've spoken to people who've had their social workers say, for example, um, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a conversation, we're going to agree what your outcomes are and what we think needs to happen. It's going to go to panel and it's going to be cut by 70%. You know, so, I mean, it, and, and that actually gives you an idea of also how workers are feeling this. Sometimes, you know, workers are, you know, I absolutely accept there's loads of workers out there who are, who are really committed to this and want to make it work. But actually, um, the reality is their hands are tied. Um, and I think it, I agree completely, um, you know, with things Ian was saying about um, lack of capacity. And it's not, it's not just about the money for packages and it's not just about moving money out of block contracts and into individual um, packages, but it's also about the capacity for, for training for social workers, for the time, and actually for the time to have those good conversations. Because that's the bit that when you do that, you know, and I've been hearing this week, I've um, been speaking to a colleague of yours, um, Eric, at a few meetings this week and hearing really great stuff um, about what's going on. But it's taken a long time. It's been a big process. And, and it means giving the workers the time to have these good conversations. And that's a massive investment. Um, and if you've got 11,000 referrals coming in, do you know, that's, that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, and I think it, it's recognising this, this is a huge change. And I, and I agree um, with what David says about, do you know, there are opportunities around integration. SDS, to me, is the answer to integration. Do you know, get the two work working really well together and the one supports the other SDS should be absolutely central to making an integration work and it really supports it but moving that money around um, you know and at the moment where folk are just getting funding for at, at critical level and nothing else means people aren't doing preventative work and it means the kind of creativity and flexibility just goes out the window because exactly that people are just looking at how much you, you know, how much can I afford? And I think the other thing that I would add to this is maybe slightly going a bit away, but I think it's important to mention is that actually the success in those kinds of conversations is not just the time spent, but it's also the trust, actually. That's crucial to making the SDS work, and I think that's a major barrier because at the moment, I would say, I think it's a fair, a fair thing to say, there is very low trust from service users in terms of, you know, when they're sitting across from someone. And an example like that, of you're sitting across from someone with a calculator, it doesn't make you feel confident and safe and, and like, here's a conversation that's going to be working for me, you know. And, and so we hear all the time of people who actually are scared to come for a review or don't want a review. So, you know, the authority doesn't have time to do review unless you're going to ask for it. But actually, you're not going to ask for it because you'd rather put up with something that isn't really working, but you know that if you have a review, the package is only going to go down. So, you know, so that's a barrier to actually people coming forward and, and going through the SDS process themselves because they're scared of it. OK, Eric, then Kenny Gibson. Um, the example, uh, the make-up example, is an alarming example. It does not chime with uh, our experience or our approach in terms of work sitting down with the calculator. Um, further point to that um, around about SDS and the conversation and the time that's invested in the conversation, if you're looking at that in terms of the public pound, the detailed depth of conversation that you have around about what matters to you will pay dividends in the future in terms of the public pound. Um, we have some, uh, you know, what, what Jess was saying about some really good personal stories, personal examples. What we've also done with those personal stories and examples that we've consistently brought to our SDS programme board and to our IJB is we've costed them pre and post the SDS conversation, and it's markedly lower. So not only can people have very good personal outcomes, they can cost the public boss less. And I think that that, you know, in the challenge that we are in, SDS has that transformative potential. And that's really where we want to focus on it, rather than unpicking some of the, the bits of it that are procedural. I suppose that's fine. The only the, the caveat I would add is that's fine that when it's driven by the individual and it then happens to result in a saving, that's good. When it's driven by the local authority in a blanket way, that's bad. And we've seen examples of that. Kenny Gibson. Yeah, it's just it's, it's, it's really a follow-up. I mean, I'm glad that things are going well in, in East Ayrshire in terms of that regard, but I think the issue, as I mentioned before, was consistency across the local authorities. And, and one of the points that was actually uh, raised by Jess Wade in her submission, basically, was, um, she said, and I quote, people are overwhelmed by the process and feel intimidated. And I think that seems to be an issue. Now, that may be an issue, not be an issue in East Ayrshire, but it seems to be an issue in other areas of Scotland. I'm just wondering if you can maybe expand a wee bit on that. Jess. So, I mean, that's a direct quote from one of our member yes. organisations who said that that's their experience in their area, but it's not only one area where people are saying that. And I think it comes back to that point I was making, that folk, you know, often feel they would rather not 
come forward for a review. They'd rather just keep things as they are, even although actually it's not really working anymore. I mean, everybody's life changes all the time. If you think about your own life and the changes, you know, are you doing exactly the same things and, and in the same way as you were this time last year or whatever? You know, life always changes. So your support needs, you know, if, you, if you're accessing support, are always going to change, whether that's because your work has changed, where you live has changed, you know, maybe now you have family where you didn't before or maybe key support that you used to have, somebody's moved away or what, what have you. Um, you know, people need to be able to, to come forward and say, actually, things have changed for me and my support needs are probably different. Um, but, yeah, people, I think, are scared of that. And I think there just isn't a level of trust. I mean, David's point is key, do you know, um, about... Um, Social workers should actually be on the side of the person, but I think more often than not, they are now seen as the gatekeepers, you know. And um, one of the, we did a piece of research uh, last year around service users' experiences of SDS, and we asked people, um, and broadly speaking, folk felt, that, that, you know, 80% plus were happy with the services they were getting, but you know, less than half of them had actually heard of self-directed support. So, you know, they hadn't necessarily been offered choice. And, and what does happy mean? You know, happy because I'm grateful because I'm getting something for free. Or, you know, actually, this is really enabling me to live a fulfilling life. So there's questions around that. And I think more research needs to be done. And it's one thing that we hope to be in a position to do. Um, but one of the things that came out of that research was actually that where things worked well, and where people really felt they had choice and control, they were, you know, also saying that they did feel they had a social worker on their side. But that wasn't always the case, you know. And I think social workers are put in a horrible... I mean, you know, uh, it's not a job that I would, you know, want to do in a million years because it's such a hard job, and especially at the moment when, you know, you know you're sitting down. And we've, you know, well, I was going to say we've all heard stories, I've certainly heard stories of workers saying, you know, I'm sitting down with this person thinking, well, if I agree to that for you, then next week... I'm going to have to make a decision, different decision for somebody else because actually I'm really conscious of how much money's been spent. And again, we are hearing good practice examples, examples of, and I think it's um, in uh, East Ayrshire, but correct me if I'm <laughs> misquoting, um, where there's you know, good systems around how much uh, budget social workers themselves can sign off on at quite a high level, I think, before it has to go to a senior manager. Um, and But regularly reviewing that and making sure that it's working successfully. Um, but, you know, then we also hear systems that are very rigid where workers don't have much autonomy to agree to very much or they know it's just going to be um, cut anyway. And that feeds into that level of, you know, you're going to feel intimidated if the person across the table from you isn't able to work in a supportive way but instead is really conscious of how much money they may or may not be able to agree to. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand that, that issue, I mean, obviously, but th is, there, is there still an issue about uh, cultural resistance whereby some uh, uh, social workers feel, to be honest, they are the ones who really know best and uh, the individuals perhaps, you know, don't know as much as, mm -hmm. as as they should and therefore the social workers feel that they they want to be in a stronger position to guide someone down a, a particular route. It's not always just mm -hmm. about finance, it's more about yeah. they say, well, I've been in this job 10 or 20 years, I think. I, I, I really know mm -hmm. what's best for mm -hmm. you. Um, is, there a, is there still that cultural issue? And is it, I mean, obviously it must vary across the country yeah. too. I think, I think there probably is to an extent, but I think I w what I would say on that is it's less than it was. You know, so when I started in my job nearly six years ago, we would go around the country and we would do stalls and speak to people about SDS, and you'd speak to workers, and they would say, you know, well, either they wouldn't know what it was at all, or they'd be saying, oh, that's that thing about letting people, you know, letting, letting people, <laughs> letting people, um, you know, organise their own lives or, you know, say what they want, and, you know, and, and you'd get a real resistance. And increasingly, I would say... Increasingly, we're, we're not hearing that as much. We are speaking more to workers who actually are, um, are up for this. You know, and, but even back then, we spoke to workers. It actually was tended to be people who'd been through training longer ago. Um, you know, was, would be saying, this is why I got into social work. This is what I want to be able to do, but the system stops me. Do you know, so I, I, I think th there will be that attitude sometimes, but in honesty, I would say it's more about the systems that are a barrier to folks so that they want to do this work, but actually they know the system isn't going to let them or there's not enough money or there's not enough time or, th or they don't have the confidence. So actually, you know, so what Colin was saying about kind of discussing the options is around... Um, you know, you might know what the options are, but you actually really understand what's available or how, how it would work in practice. And then you don't maybe have the confidence to, to talk to somebody about that. So you might guide them down a route that you know better how it works um, rather than 
you know, going down another route where you're thinking, actually, I don't really know how to do this either. So, I'm, you know, I'm going to steer this person away from that. Um, so there's an issue about making the process more simple and straightforward if there are people who are intimidated by it. Uh, and, and there are and there are seem, seemingly unnecessary complexities within the system. I think it's about making sure people have the right support, you know, so to go through that. And I think the complexities are, are I mean, for the individual in lots of ways, it's, it should be straight. It should be straightforward. What what's set up is not doesn't have to be complicated. I think it's how you present the information again, like what Colin said. It's it's actually how information is presented, but it, it shouldn't be. I think we all just talking a lot of jargon all the time, but it shouldn't be impossible to explain SDS to people in a straightforward way. But what's difficult is the complexities within how it's delivered, at the kind of behind the scenes, it makes it very hard then for workers, I think, to, you know, navigate. Okay, thanks, Kandina. Mm -hmm. Ian Smith? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think a lot of the barriers are probably caused more by the processes and systems that these social workers are having to operate within, the strategic commissioning structures which say that, you know, drive you down a particular route to, to receive a service or restrictions on how you can use uh, your, your uh, self-directed support payments, some of which are not actually lawful, you know, that, that they're told you can only use it for this thing and you can actually, legally you can use it for anything which meets that outcome. Um, there are some examples in the makeup evidence of people being driven towards a particular service, um, council run service service rather than a private service because it's marginally cheaper, um, but it doesn't meet the person's individual outcomes. Um, there are examples, I think, in Highlands where there was uh, restrictions on how you could use your self-directed support payment, um, which were clearly uh, with the, the, the spirit of the Act, if not the, the letter of the Act, which have now having to be amended, thanks to them now not actually talking to disabled people's organisations in the area uh, to try and get these things sorted out. So there are a number of areas, I think, which are still to be ironed out at how local authorities uh, loosen up their internal systems in a way which actually allows people to take advantage of the the options that are there. I think one other thing I just want to say is I think one of the important things is there needs to be a, an opportunity to allow people to make mistakes, that people should be able to try um, an option, a, a, a way of giving their support provided, and if it find out that it doesn't work for them, that it can be quickly corrected. And I think the present there's a fear amongst probably um, you know, the risk averse uh, uh, people within councils and also perhaps individuals that if they try something, then they're going to be stuck with this for a year and it be, or two or whatever till the next review. Um, and I think there needs to be an opportunity to, to experiment uh, to get the right service for an individual. Okay, David and then Colin. Thank you, uh, Chair. The, I, I think uh, many of the comments that have been conveyed by Jess and Ian are, are, are absolutely uh, right, um, but I think we need to be really careful and mindful that we're not, we don't get into a position where it's the system is, is just the local authority system. The system is broader than that, uh, and that is around about expectations that are of social workers as much and local authorities. So many of the processes, I think, are bureaucratic. We uh, absolutely wholeheartedly uh, 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 sign up to that, and they could be and should be leaner. Uh, and more understandable, no question about that. Uh, but right now, uh, Glasgow City uh, Health and Social Care sp uh, Partnership is spending £65 million every year of public money on uh, personalisation, on self-directed support. So you can't have too freed up a system without being able to account for that level of spend on public sector uh, budgets. But I do think there is uh, a place to go, uh, and, and that is around about, um, as I su suggested earlier on, how do we move away from that inputs and outputs type of provision, which is actually the, the, f the fundamental driver for the hourly-based procurement of services, to something that is more outcomes orientated around about the the whole and the totality of the individual budgets that that our people uh, are, are allocated to i understand uh, absolutely the comments around about uh, risk aversion but i don't think that's something that social workers uh, innately are uh, i think they are i think there can be a risk aversion in the system and probably is a risk aversion in the system uh, but that probably comes as a as a societal pressure on what social workers are expected to do for our most vulnerable citizens so uh, and, and 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 that drives behavior that drives a, a response that that 
absolutely says, eh, I will do whatever I need to in order to uh, ensure that the people who I've got some statutory responsibility for uh, are uh, as safe as possible because uh, I don't want to be the social worker who is uh, hitting the front pages of the newspapers uh, or uh, the media outlets as a consequence of something terrible happening, which is what happens to social workers who are involved in child deaths cases, for instance, not being responsible for, but actually uh, social workers are held accountable. So it, the title social worker sits across the piece. Uh, I agree with you in terms of, uh, Jess, the comments you made that self-directed support actually, uh, if it's implemented in the way that it should be implemented, is actually what drives social workers to come into this business in the first place. Uh, and 30 years ago, when I was doing my training uh, as a social worker, it, my view was actually uh, that I understood my function to be about enabling and empowering people to take control of their own lives. Uh, and as a system, actually, over the last 20 years, we have become a very much doing to system, not just a profession, but system to people uh, rather than a doing with and allowing to happen. Uh, and I think self-directed support is getting us back to a place where social work should be. But as I say, it's not just about social work. Colin Young. Yeah, um, come back to the point maybe we are where we are. And I think from our research, it seems that if people know and have a, a fun conversation about what they cause are what the resources is, then they understand that. They know the situation, but it's about the flexibility and the resistance to allow people to take more control over their own choices. And, and this issue that you raised about issues that seem to be flouting the legislation that is really worrying when people are being told you're not allowed to use this for X when the legislation is quite clear that if it meets the outcome. And this has real consequences for people. For instance, we interviewed someone who had moved authorities and Previously, she was allowed the budget in a lump sum to take her husband away once a year. But when she moved authority, they said, no, you have to take it month on month. And that really restricted what she was able to do. It led to much poor outcomes for people. We also had instances of people being having a budget agreed to, to pay for their support assistance lunch, and this went on for one year. But then the local authority came back and said, "Actually, you're not allowed to do that. So can you pay us two thousand pounds, please?" So, I think it does come from senior management and people being given the autonomy to make sensible, common sense decisions. Okay. Alex Neil. Can I ask a general question to our guests? Um, has any work been done since the Act was passed uh, to demonstrate and evaluate the impact of SDF on outcomes? Uh, you know, compared to have the outcomes improved prior to the introduction of SDF? Uh, is there evidence that those authorities that have made more progress in implementation SDF are, are achieving better outcomes? Uh, is is there a Said, I mean, there are 31 partnerships plus the Highlands. Um, we are we spreading best practice. Um, what are the arrangements for that? You know, is the improvement service doing that, or who's doing that? Is it happening? You know, I mean, I take and I'm very conscious of all of these points about 
uh, whether the system is actually working as well as it was intended or should be, and clearly there are a number of issues that need to be addressed to do that. But even with its faults, is it actually making a difference to outcomes? <laughs> Well, I mean, Eric will know, you know what's happening in your own area. Um, I, I think in terms of like a, a national picture of, oh, you know, when people get SDS, then it, it works better or something. I don't, I don't think that exists. I think there's lots of um, sharing of good practice. Um, so we've got loads of examples and, and, and most organisations who are working in SDS, uh, in and around SDS, will have... Um, case study examples so where you can see that for an individual um, life has changed for the better after having a good SDS conversation and sometimes that's a case study that also shows oh and it costs a bit less and sometimes it maybe costs the same and sometimes it maybe costs more and, and sometimes that's okay right um, so um, I think there's lots of really good practice examples and, and individual cases um, but I'm not sure there's anything that sort of says and, I, and I'd be really interested to know if there are authorities who've actually said do you know what folk on, on meeting better outcomes now um, I mean one thing I would say is you know Scottish government is in the process of starting what's called an evaluability study and so some of that is going to look at some of the gaps in evidence and, and so whether that will come out of that you know I don't know Eric just to reinforce what Jess has said, there's national networks that are there where people are able to share good practice. Um, we've certainly engaged positively with them from an East Ayrshire point of view. Um, we've, uh, throughout the implementation of the Act, undertaken self-evaluation activity and audit activity to understand the impact it's having on individuals, looking at um, costs, as Jess said, but also how the individual's outcomes are identified, how well that's done, uh, how that well that equates to the, the individual budget that individuals get at the end of all those things. So it's been ongoing self-evaluation and, and audit for us. Can I ask you, Eric, does that show that self-directed support of itself improves <coughs> outcomes? I, th I, I think we can say that through case studies and examples. I, th I think doing that as a global judgment, we'd need to be better at capturing outcomes yes. and actually, you know, codifying those outcomes. Okay. David? Well, just very quickly, uh, we never counted outcomes before or we never evaluated against outcomes before, so we're starting from a very low base uh, from that perspective and, and, and we made assumptions that things were going well and going right for people, uh, but I think the, the legislation, and Eric said, uh, touched on it there, uh, in, in a systematic way, the answer is probably no. We're not. We're not. Certainly not in Glasgow. Uh, but we have uh, significant volumes of case studies, examples where, uh, and uh, people are routinely uh, write, writing in to you know uh, the likes of myself or my managers locally just to say thank you. Uh, because their daughter or son has transitioned from uh, a young person in, in transition through to adulthood and something through the support of, for instance, our local area coordinators uh, and activity that's been able to put in place a uh, life-changing uh, uh, kind of an, an, uh, uh, provision and support for people that doesn't cost an awful lot of money when not long ago that, that young person might have ended up just going to a daycare centre for the rest of their days. Uh, so there's a, a qualitatively different experience that is, that is increasing. Uh, it, and 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 I think that uh, we 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 get very few complaints if if that's another way of putting it uh, in 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 that respect. Yeah, that's a key point. Convenient is it's not just a quantitative thing. It's a more importantly, it's a qualitative improvement, and that's the most difficult thing to measure, obviously. Okay, Bill Bowman. Oh, thank you, Convener. If I can maybe just comment on some of the things we've spoken about, and then ask a question. I think, uh, and David Williams, you, um, in response to Alec Neil, spoke about um, compliance with an act that you said you were compliant, but um, you couldn't evidence that, and you weren't able to give Alex uh, an indication of when you could. To me, that's a bit of a red flag that, um, you know, are you going to go and do something about that? I've written at the top of my bit of paper here. Yes. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I think um, Jess Wade mentioned that in the situation of a finance department making a choice between you know, this payment and that payment, and I think, as you said, you, you know, how would they make that choice? And I think that brought me on to what Colin Young said. Of course, should be in the interest of the individual. 
And if that doesn't come through from the top of the organisation, then you know I don't think we have much chance in fulfilling the, the requirements of of the of the Act. Well, not just the requirements, but the but the spirit. We've heard, um, you know, if you're immersed in, the, in this topic, it's easy to use sort of jargon. And I think even here we've had a, a, you know, a few things, you know, community capacity, natural assets, maybe, you know, some acronyms that are very familiar to, to all of you, maybe not so familiar to me. And that sort of leads me on to what I think um, Jess Wade was speaking about, user-led independent <coughs> bodies. Can you just tell me a bit more? Is there a structure for these? Is it just ad hoc? You know, how does it? Sure, great. How do you actually get? Yes. Okay. Real Love to. <laughs> um, so, uh, what I would say, there's no, there's ne not necessarily a particular model, but most of our members follow a, a relatively consistent model. So. Um, it, in different authorities, you have different setups, basically based on, on, on what's needed locally and what the priorities are. And different organisations have come about differently. So, um, GCI and Glasgow is, is possibly the oldest one in the country, um, and came about through a mix of uh, campaigning from disabled people um, themselves and um, collective voice uh, and support from people within the council. Key people within the council supported the setup of that organisation, and that's what got it off the ground. Um, and some of those people are working in and around the fringes of social care and SDS uh, now, many many years later. Um, you know, and and many of the, the disabled people themselves have gone on then to work in other. Um, user-led organisations around the country um, and actually you can trace the start of that back to the seeds of, of GCIL um, but in different areas um, so Ayrshire uh, Independent Living Network um, in Ayrshire covers uh, is user-led as well um, and they cover the three authorities which is great because it gives them um, some kind of consistency there um, but working across the different areas in, in Edinburgh we have Lothian Centre for Inclusive Living which covers the four authority areas but there's different, um, slightly different Different approaches. Most of those organisations will be uh, registered charities, so they'll be registered with the Scottish Charity Regulator, Oscar, um, and they will have a governance structure where the highest level of their governance, so their management committee, their board of trustees, uh, or board of directors, whatever they are referred to, are um, service users, disabled people, and in some organisations that might include carers of um, people who are accessing services, um, and some organisations it will be people who are disabled people but not receiving services, and sometimes it will be only people who are receiving services. Um, are there some black spots where there are no Yes, bodies? so there's definite gaps. Um, there's gaps where either there's no... Um, I mean, can you name them? Um, uh, now I should have brought a list, that would have been good. Um, we've got um, a sort of mapping website that covers the whole of Scotland where people can search for what's in their area. But there's definitely key authorities where either there's nothing user-led or there's maybe nothing at all that you can just go straight to um, and get support. So there might be organisations where you have to How do you enter first. into this? Would somebody in the care system suggest that you go? Yeah. Or do you have to find out for yourself? Well, so ideally, um, you would get... If you're finding out that or thinking about the fact that you need support, what would what would really be ideal and feedback from our members is that ideally you would get actually a referral at that point. So somebody, if you start to speak to somebody in social work, uh, thinking about getting support, actually most of our members would really love that that social worker or whoever it is then says to you, oh, did you know there's an organisation in your area who can help you think about your options and then you're able to speak to them as well. And that means that you've potentially got that support right through your journey. So you could have somebody, um, for example, and the kinds of work that these organisations are doing is anything from, um, you know, somebody sitting in um, at an assessment with you, not necessarily saying something, but just sitting there, um, or helping you prepare for assessment in advance, helping you think about actually what support could I benefit from in my life, that kind of thing. Do social workers give that type of advice to um, people they're speaking to? Yes. Columns or so, so. Uh -huh. Where it's available. <coughs> On the only, only, sorry, around the third of people we surveyed hadn't heard or didn't know they had a no qualified centre. So how many had? Had or hadn't? A third hadn't heard of a, third hadn't a, local, heard. Sur a local service and about a fifth didn't know what we were talking about. So I don't think it's very widespread yeah. knowledge. 
I think it's very important that uh, user-led organisations are involved in this process because they bring the direct lived experience of the, the users of services to the, uh, the to the table, and I think that's much more significant than just um, you know somebody who can like myself, give advice or advocacy. Uh, actually having that lived experience is very important. The key thing about user-led organisations is they are run by disabled people themselves, um, and that is, uh, is significant. And I just want to put an important word of caution out there is that a lot of disabled people's organisations in local areas are suffering from significant cuts in, in funding, uh, and in many areas are going to the wall because they are not getting support. Uh, sometimes that is because they were providing a service uh, for the local authority which has gone out to tender and has been awarded to another, usually a large uh, disability organisation like Capability or Enable or someone like that, um, instead of them, and therefore they're no longer able to then provide the other good quality stuff that they provide as a disabled people's organisation. So I think um, if you're looking at this whole thing in the round, if you're looking at health and social care integration in the round, self-directed support in the round, you actually need to think about the who you support in a local community in order to ensure that the voice of disabled people actually gets to the table. Jess Wade. Just coming in on that as well, actually, Ian, and, and you know, your question about are the gaps or were, you know, where are the significant gaps, I think the other key thing to note is that at the moment the Scottish Government is currently funding a lot of independent information and support at local level, so there would be a lot more gaps if that funding wasn't happening. There's going to be another round of funding, so again, you know, there will be work funded, but there is a question about long term, how is this, how is this funded? It, should it be funded locally? Should it be funded centrally? We're, and, and if it should be funded locally, which you know is is the, is the current basis that although Scottish government is putting in funding, that's very much about uh, you know a period of change. Um, you know, it, it's it's the local authority's responsibility to make sure this this provision is there. Um, you know, but in the areas where there were gaps before this funding started, will those gaps continue when that funding goes? And I think there's a lot of concern from organisations. Um, about that, and also around, you know, their level of independence if if they are receiving funding locally. Okay. Um, sorry, Eric. Just going to say that signposting to those organisations is built into our public information, into our assessment process, and into our guidance to practitioners. It's constantly reinforced. And, and that's fantastic. And that's, you know, I think that's w what we want to see more of that in other areas, because we know there are organisations operating in some areas that then don't necessarily get routinely signposted to. So like Colin said, folk are getting services, but they haven't even heard that actually there was an organisation that could have made that process easier for them. David? Yeah, um, I think it's really interesting, the, the slightly contradictory comment that you made there, Jess, around about the, the anxiety around about Scottish Government funding for uh, these organisations and actually it should be done locally but there's also a concern around about the level of arm's length uh, kind of uh, uh, and so I, I'm not sure how we can have it both ways uh, from that perspective um, but I, I think there is also something around about provider organisations in general where that has because the, the necessarily self-directed support legislation created technically a business risk for provider organisations because uh, we've heard the comments around about block contracts, around about uh, you know, uh, big packages of support off based on an inputs and outputs basis for an individual going to a particular organisation. Uh, that that Self-directed support necessarily creates a, a business risk if you, if, if you in, in, move towards uh, full, you know, complete choice uh, and the ability to switch providers left, right and centre. So there is a need to manage that uh, really carefully so that you don't create so much uncertainty and instability in the marketplace. Uh, and we already know that one of the issues for uh, social care is the ability to recruit staff uh, and uh, and ensure that they're uh, uh, recruited at the kind of right level of quality and the right level of skill sets in order to be able to, to meet the needs. So there are challenges in the system around about how, uh, with the best will in the world, a, 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 a properly principled bit of legislation can actually be implemented uh, in the full, uh, in the context that we're on, in. On the back of that, can I ask how you're changing your commissioning strategies? To, to cope with that? Yeah, well, one of the things, again, this links to the, the opportunities that integration, I think, provides, because there is that commissioning responsibility that comes through uh, IJBs, uh, is, uh, and, and also that spirit of partnership. Uh, much more so. We are in Glasgow, for instance, uh, in, in relation to uh, co-produced commissioning uh, that we have embarked on in relation to our homelessness services. 
uh, for instance, uh, and uh, we are uh, increasingly looking at uh, working, well, not increasingly, we are actually working uh, at this moment in time to, to look at how we can develop something called alliance commissioning, which is around about actually giving an awful lot more control of the commissioning responsibility to uh, provider organisations in terms of coming up with a spec around about uh, tenders. We do have to go through tenders for big bits of work. There's nothing that we can do to avoid that. Um, and, and I think that the, the integration agenda around about partnership working creates that opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not straightforward by any stretch of the imagination to develop something like Alliance Commissioning because of the constraints that are on local authorities uh, and also on the system just in terms of how we can procure work differently. Uh, and as I've touched on before, I think there is something that needs to be a, a, about moving away from the procurement of services on, on an hourly basis or on a time basis because uh, that is absolutely about inputs and outputs. So coming back to the earlier question from uh, Mr Kerr there in relation to the calculator story, you can, if, if that's happening, you can actually see how that could happen because if somebody's got an individual budget of £10,000, let's say, uh, then uh, straight away, if you know the hourly rates of your provider, You'll be you'll be working out what what is that that uh, we can deliver for that ten thousand pounds, and immediately you're into an inputs and outputs mindset rather than something that's focused on uh, actually what is it that's right for you to do. Uh, so there are parameters in there, but we are working on uh, change, trying to change that kind of uh, uh, environment. Okay. Let, let let me ask another question because some of us will see this through our constituency casework that there is a ceiling put on some care packages, and some of them may be more complex than others. So I'm keen to know, given that Ian Smith rightly identified resource being the elephant in the room, um, whether that's the case across the board, whether there's flexibility there, and whether you count unmet need, because to me that tells a story about what we should be funding but can't afford to. So I'm curious to know if whether you routinely as organisations count unmet need. And, and let me start with the, the local authorities. Eric. The bigger challenge for us is being able to shape that, the market and the capacity in the community in a different way through how people realise their outcomes. That, that then gets us into a truly outcomes-focused way of commissioning. If, if people are being creative around about how they realise their outcomes, we are looking at the provider landscape that we've got, the services that we've got, and we are then able to shape them through the different ways that people are realising their outcomes. That, that's the real big challenge for me in, in how that works. Um, alongside that, it is all about the, the collaborative commissioning, the alliance commissioning, different approaches where rather than it being a, a paternalistic relationship between a local authority and providers, you're getting much more towards having the conversation about what kind of outcomes get met, how do we do that um, you know, together, and how do you set your measures um, on that basis. So I, th I think it's, it's the question the other way around. I know, um, but let me not, come back to my way of putting question it. For me. Right. Uh, it's how, <laughs> how the outcomes are positively realised, then influencing commissioner, because people will want to realise their outcomes in different ways, and it's many and varied. I absolutely understand that, but you've got a finance director sitting on your shoulder. Is there an upper limit to the care packages you can offer? Not in that way. Not, not in, in what a, way, then? Not in a, in a ceiling. OK. No. So there's no ceiling. You can offer an unlimited amount to realising somebody's outcomes. You have no unmet need in East Asia, is what you're telling me. Not saying that at all. Ah, OK. Do you count unmet need? need? Not scientifically, no. OK. No. Moved, moved away from doing it. You, you count it in terms of whether outcomes are met, whether they're partially met, or whether they okay. are unmet as outcomes, but not in terms of how we previously did that through former assessment-type documents. Um, okay. Don't do it that way. Okay. David? Uh, Personalisation, yes, we would have counted. Yeah. Uh, and we would have had a list of people whose needs we were not able to meet because actually uh, we had a dis dis disproportionate and inequitable system of allocation of resources. And so people who had come out of the big hospitals, for instance, came out with big packages. Uh, and increasingly over the years following that, uh, people with equivalent need in different parts of the city were getting uh, hugely disparate levels of, of allocation and some, some we're not getting. So once upon a time, yes, we were able to. And the point about us moving to uh, the personalisation approach prior to the legislation coming in was about recognising that the budget was the budget uh, and, and, and it was inequitably distributed. 
uh, and increasingly so. So we needed to get to a point where there was a, 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 um, a, a kind of assessment of equivalent need across the city, which would allow for an equitable and fairer distribution uh, across the system. So that's why we went down the resource allocation system, the RAS model. Uh, uh, within Glasgow, rather than looking at the equivalence model, which was just about basic, which is the other route to allocation of resources that many authorities have taken. The equivalence route is, is essentially what you had before, you get the same again. Um, and uh, and that's, uh, that move to a resource allocation system created some of the challenges for us from uh, individuals early uh, early on in the system uh, but with it so and, and the way that works is that if if you have an assessed need with a, a broadly comparable level of need uh, across the uh, across the city then then you get as an individual bu budget X the point about the then moving to the outcome based support planning approach is about looking at so how can that uh, allocation resource go towards contributing towards your outcomes. And there's a conversation on a co-produced basis, dialogue uh, with the individual, which looks at uh, perhaps uh, needing an increase in that. And actually that does happen uh, because the senior managers or who are trying to establish consistency of approach across the city do have capacity and, and, and scope uh, with which to, to uh, provide that nuanced bit that makes it absolutely personalised for that individual uh, and, and so there is a capacity for, for increase. Uh, it's very rare that the individual budget I think is reduced uh, within the city because it is about based on individual need but that might be uh, able to be reduced for a variety of good reasons like the, the, the implementation of choice. Uh, is there a limit? Uh, la two, two or three weeks ago, I signed off uh, on a package of support uh, well, over, well in excess of a quarter of a million pounds per year uh, for somebody coming through transition, uh, and uh, a quarter of a million pounds is way off the RAS score. Okay. We will meet need when we need to. Okay. Anybody got anything to add? Ian. I, th I think the problem about defining unmet need is how you define need in the first place, because um, we would argue that because the criteria has, has shifted and it's now much higher level of need before you actually receive any support, that there's a lot of unmet need below that level at which they're the support. But you could say, well, actually, we've defined these people as assessing, assessed as having a need because they're in critical uh, need, uh, and we're meeting that. Um, the people who are lower down the chain, who we think should be getting support as well, in order to be able to in live independently, are not getting support. That is unmet need, but that probably wouldn't be measured under any definition because this S need is being met. Okay, Jess. Exactly the same as, as what Ian said. Um, I'm, I suppose the only thing I would add to it is that you know, um, with changing eligibility, so that you know, where previously uh, you might have got your own package that you could have then had SDS uh, conversations around. Um, it, at say um, meeting substantial, you know, having substantial need, you might only get that now at critical, or you know, where you previously would have got that at moderate, and now you would only get it at substantial. Um, you know, do we really believe that local authorities were previously giving out lots of money to individuals that they didn't need? Because you know, I, I don't think authorities would have been doing that, and if they were, why were they? Um, so you know, I think that's maybe a way to also think about it that we know there are folk who previously would have got money, but now now won't so that exactly what Ian said that's where the unmet need really is okay so the bar's getting higher David well, it probably is necessarily getting high <coughs> because of the resource issue but I I, I do think there is a, a, a need for us to be balanced in relation to assumptions again around about what need equates to and I, I take fully on board what Ian and, Tri and Jess have said uh, but the the the, the, the uh, parents letter that I alluded to that I received a couple of weeks ago uh, their daughter uh, has daughter down syndrome uh, and has been uh, 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 provided with support uh, through the week which doesn't involve any social work funding at all uh, and and they have expressed their complete contentment about that so we need to make be clear that we're not making assumptions that just because somebody has a learning disability or a physical disability or a mental health issue or is aged elderly that they necessarily require social work intervention uh, and it is about that uh, that clear uh, professional judgment uh, coupled with uh, what else is around that might actually provide the opportunity for people to get the support that they actually need. Okay, Eric, did you want to come in? Just to echo that, um, absolutely, that it's how that conversation takes place. 
and, and if we're having a conversation sitting around about people's natural assets and, and that jargon, apologies, uh, community capacity that's there, then that's where that conversation starts with. And if people don't need statutory intervention, we may well have been over-prescribing in the past. Okay. Colin. Yeah, I can't speak to how unmeted, unmet need is identified, but we heard examples of even when need is identified and an indicative body is um, suggested, people were still not getting that budget. So the local authority assessed and identified that there are needs, but they're not being met. But even though they think they require so, so, Sorry, Ian. Just to mention one other aspect of unmet need is that there are substantial waiting times for assessments in some local authorities uh, and also waiting times once you've been assessed to actually receive the package that you've been assessed as requiring. So that's an unmet need which is quantifiable. And, and what I'm picking up in every area we've discussed is inconsistency across local authorities that really shouldn't be happening. Um, so it does depend, you know, to use that horrible term of postcode lottery, it does depend on where you live as to the nature of the service you get. Okay, um, outcome-based, um, not resource-led, any final comments on that before I move us on to the final theme? No? Okay, we're moving on. Removing the barriers to successful implementation, and let me just kick that off by, by let's, let's recognise that not everything is perfect, despite the two local authorities here, not everything is perfect. Um, what do we need to do to change it? Is it a problem with the legislation? Or is it actually a problem with implementation? Does resource have anything to do with it? Or is it culture? Who wants to kick off first? Eric smiled at me, so he's going first. <laughs> culture is a, is a huge aspect within this, um, I think. Um, I, I think it's culture and implementation out of, out of your questions, first off. Um, and it really is that it's that bit about workforce development, organisational <laughs> development, making sure that you have the capacity to support people to operate in a different way uh, that's required under the legislation. Um, it is um, senior leadership um, permission and support for implementing that within the spirit and letter of the law. Um, that, that's my take on, on those questions. It's very helpful. Ian? Yeah, I, think, I think it is implementation, but it's also, I think, there's an issue in relation to the fact that local authorities at the same time as being required to implement self-directed support legislation have also been required to implement health and social care integration. Uh, and I think that has probably taken a lot of the focus from senior management um, because, it's, as David mentioned earlier, it is a fairly major piece of work. Um, there's also, um, there are concerns within um, the disabled, disabled people's movement, the independent living movement, that the health and social care integration is, is very much focused on the health side, not enough on the social care side, and that the, um, the wider role of social care in enabling people to play an active part in society is being lost, and it's more health care in the community rather than social care. Um, how that plays through once the, uh, the integration gets more full, uh, fully bedded down and perhaps self-directed support becomes more of an asset, a part of things that health social care integration partnerships deliver, uh, we have to wait and see. But I think there is an issue there about just how much is trying to be delivered at the same time by under pressure local authorities. Okay. Under pressure local authority, David? Well, that's not us, clearly, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't oh, mind, no, of Glasgow course it is. Oh, has enough risk uh, We're always, uh, we're always under pressure. I mean, I think the, yeah. the, 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 the facts of the matter are uh, that uh, the day job hasn't actually gone away just because of integration of health and social care. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the integration has required us to do something measurably different about how we organise ourselves in order to ensure that the planning and delivery and receipt and experience of health and social care across the entirety of the age range in Glasgow, that's not necessarily uh, replicated out everywhere, but certainly across uh, the entirety of the age range, is measurably different. Uh, and as I said earlier on, for, for us in Glasgow, 
Glasgow in particular, uh, there are opportunities, huge opportunities that come as a consequence of that, that are completely consistent with the self-directed support legislation around about co-production. So the, uh, the, the issue of, for instance, Alliance commissioning, uh, the issue of how we've worked in a co-produced way in relation to homelessness services and addiction services, providers work, that's all happened as a consequence of the beginnings of that embedding at a, a, a very local level, a, 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 a kind of locality-based uh, approach to uh, the delivery of services that's come through uh, the self-directed support legislation. I just want to touch on and, on, and add to um, uh, what Eric said already about culture. I think culture again is absolutely uh, 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 an issue uh, in relation to self-directed support because this has meant change. It has meant change in, 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 in the way that people uh, deliver services and receive services. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a challenge for everybody. Uh, and I, I think we're still working through all of that. But necessarily, and it kind of links to the previous point around about uh, issues not being resource-led, uh, one of the, some, some of you around the table will, will be aware that as part of our implementation uh, in relation to personalisation in Glasgow, uh, part of that resulted in the closure of five learning disability day centres uh, with just two remaining. Now these centres were long cherished, long uh, wanted, long desired uh, by particularly uh, carers. Uh, of, uh, of uh, service users who had been intending uh, day centres for anything up to 25 years. Uh, but what we very clearly wanted to do was, was demonstrate absolutely that just because you had uh, a particular uh, identified need once upon a time, that doesn't mean to say that we actually shouldn't be striving for something better and different for you. Uh, and, the, and, and literally hundreds of people have come through and, uh, and moved out of the, those five-day centres uh, and been supported into a different form of support, uh, which has given them lots more opportunities and better outcomes as a consequence of that. Uh, I do th and, and, but the culture, cultural challenge across the system, across the community, uh, uh, in relation to the prospect of closing learning disability day centres was not straightforward. And that's not just about lo the local authority social workers. OK, Liam Kerr. Just to pick up on Jackie's question, the uh, report that uh, I guess underpins our conversation today uh, contains various recommendations at uh, pages six and seven on various bodies uh, as to what they could be doing. Uh, do any of you have a view on Will those recommendations actually move SDS forward? And assuming so, do you have a view on whether the various bodies that are required to undertake the recommendations are actually undertaking them? Eric. Uh, there's a report going to our IJB um, this very afternoon um, setting out the recommendations and we, the, that will be guiding um, the activity of our Thinking Differently programme board, which is the successor to the SDS programme board, which I probably should say at this moment met all the way through our integration process as well. Um, so they certainly will be going there and um, they will inform the work programme of the Thinking Differently programme board that will be taking forward that whole work stream. And is that something, forgive me, I'll just cut in on that and come back to the wider question. <clears throat> is that something that's replicated across Scotland or is that just something that you've been particularly good on? can't speak for the rest of Scotland. Um, my understanding is that there are similar programme type arrangements across other partnerships. Um, we, we've just set that up from 2013 onwards and it um, has been transformed into a, a broader programme board. Thank you. Yes, David. We, I took a, a report to, on the Audit Scotland report to our IJB Finance and Audit Committee uh, on the 6th of September, so literally within uh, a week or two of the publication of the report, uh, and we set out in, in that uh, some draft responses to uh, each of the recommendations, so we're certainly driving forward in uh, Glasgow uh, an acknowledgement of the, the, the findings and the conclusions and the recommendations, uh, and as colleagues from Audit Scotland are aware, I uh, organised to meet with with them separately uh, uh, shortly after the publication of the report so that we could find out, I could find out uh, what specific issues are around about Glasgow. So we've, we're, we're absol absolutely uh, engaged in that. It, by way of a programme board, 
uh, I, uh, thinking in terms of Glasgow, I don't have a, a specific programme board in relation to self-directed support or personalisation uh, in Glasgow, and the reason for that is because it absolutely is seen as business as usual. It's, it, it's, it's the primary route into uh, adult social care and uh, for uh, children with disabilities, children uh, with uh, children with disabilities, uh, social care. Uh, we did have uh, very extensive levels of uh, scrutiny and uh, planning uh, uh, arrangements uh, in place for uh, a number of years uh, uh, f following our impl inter implementation of uh, personalisation in 2011. Uh, which were multi-stakeholder, uh, which were uh, linked absolutely to the then council's responsibilities in terms of, uh, so it was a subcommittee of uh, the Health and Social Care uh, Policy Development Committee. Uh, and only when the integration legislation uh, came into effect uh, in, in Glasgow City uh, last uh, year, last uh, February, March, did that subgroup uh, uh, get disbanded. As, as a consequence of us having moved uh, to this being business as usual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Jess? I, I mean, I think the recommendations are, are really solid, you know. Um, the question is whether everyone will follow them. And, and also, I think, for me, that comes back to the point about really the disconnect around implementation, so between central government and local government. Um, you know, I, th I think the legislation is sound, um, but it's... It, it's to what extent it's being followed. And so where we see things in, in local authorities happening that aren't necessarily um, within the spirit of the legislation, you know, often we might get in touch and, and express that view. And sometimes the response is, well, it's open to interpretation. You know, and so it's very, very difficult then to say, okay, well, it, it's quite clear what you should be doing, but often you, the response is, well, you know, it's up to us to decide locally. So I wonder, in terms of the recommendations, you know, what will happen? It, will people have to feedback on what they have or haven't done? And it's really reassuring to hear the authorities are saying, actually, we've worked through that and we've come up with what we're going to do. Well, it'd be great to see that for 32 authorities, you mm. know. Can I just press you on the, the... You mentioned the Scottish Government in your answer. Uh, do you... Have any view on what the Scottish Government should be specifically doing to help implementation? Um, I think I, I would like to see greater, um, I guess, leadership direction towards authorities. And, and I, I think that's a very difficult thing for Scottish Government to do with, with the way things are set up in this country at the moment. So um, it, it's very difficult for Scottish Government to give quite strong direction towards local authorities about where they need to change or improve, I think, or sometimes it seems that way. <laughs> and, uh, David, do you have a view on that answer that you've just heard? Uh, well, I think, the, the, coming back to the Chair's uh, initial question around about is the legislation fine? I think the legislation is fine. I think there are guide there is guidance, there are statutory instruments that require local authorities to follow. Um, uh, and and so it, it, it's, it, 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 it's difficult to see uh, beyond that, how much more uh, uh, authority the local the local authorities could be provided by direction from Scottish government? That the Scottish government has discharged its its responsibilities. It is up to local authorities to to implement. Uh, my expectation is that Audit Scotland's uh, findings uh, in their most recent report. I would expect, as I have done, and I've indicated the same is happening in East Ayrshire, uh, that 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 this report will will appear in the public domain through uh, I. JB committees uh, or boards um, uh, 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 imminently. Um, that's, that's not unreasonable to expect because it's a transparent process that we need to be engaged with. That's the spirit of the legislation. That's what integration is actually about. Uh, so I don't see why this would be any different. Colin. Um, that is quite a worrying answer because if you play the context of the whole premise of self-directed support was to ensure choice and control. And we're seven years into the strategy in Scottish government figures, so shows that only 27% of people have been offered choice and control. That, never mind whether that's leaving leading to the outcomes, the actual action of making sure people have drugs in control is still shockingly low. So we've, the alliance recommended the report that 
if there isn't a substantial increase in the near future. And consider we've only got two years before the SDS strategy comes to an end. We would be looking for a review of the act try to push the implementation of conversations at the very least forward to increase uptake. Okay. Ian? Stad, I think um, we've talked quite a lot in the course of this morning about the inconsistency of information and um, that, that's available about the inf the, the, how it's monitored. And I think the Scottish Government has a fundamental role in ensuring that there is a, um, a more consistent approach across local authorities of how they record uh, options and that there is a more consistent approach in terms of how we monitor the implementation both from local authorities themselves but also working with the people who receive the services uh, as to how they think it's actually working for them um, so we can actually get some of this uh, data about um, about how whether outcomes are improving. Um, that isn't there. There isn't a, a consistent approach across Scotland on, on that, and I think the Scottish Government does have a fairly fundamental role there. The other thing I think which is crucial in the recommendations from the Audit Committee is there's quite a number of references to working in partnership with the service users. We need to ensure that service users' organisations have the resources to be able to do that, uh, which means that we, that we build capacity of, of disabled people's organisations and local communities to ensure that they can support their, their members to, to participate in all these significant areas where the Audit Commission rightly says that service users should be involved in the process. Willie? Okay, I just wonder if I could raise another issue that's, uh, that's been identified as one of the barriers by the Auditor General, and that is re relating to recruitment, training, remuneration and retention of social care staff. It, it clearly has a huge, a huge issue. What, what, what are the panel's views on how we can make some improvements there, short of the obvious, in, in making more money available and more of a career path and structure for people that want to go into the sector? What, just, what are your thoughts on how we can make some improvements here? The things you've just said are, are, are key to, to making improvements, you know, um, and actually the shared ambition um, document that Ian mentioned earlier talks about that as well. It's about seeing social care completely differently and it's about seeing it as an asset across the country, you know, that um, this, is, this shouldn't be seen as kind of the, the dregs of the jobs or what have you. This should be seen as, a, as a, an important career that does have opportunities for progression, but that actually also even without progression, this is really important work and it needs to be uh, well paid um, and people need to feel valued for it. Um, we see um, a lot of uh, people we work with who are employing personal assistants directly, I would say have much more consistency uh, with their own workforce than you see within organisations and that's because there's a personal relationship there and people get to work together and when it works really well you know then understandably folk want to stay in that situation they don't want to leave it so I think um, that's where actually where, where direct payments work well for people and where uh, personal assistant employment works well for people then um, that can lead to greater consistency there um, but, but there's a lot of difficult issues I think yeah. Can, can I ask when you talk enhanced remuneration I mean presumably you're talking about carers and providers and I mean clearly one of the issues all the evidence shows with social care providers very often it's not just a remuneration issue but it's a lack of career development mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. which is actually in some instances a bigger barrier to progress than the levels of remuneration so uh, I think is that, is that, that's presumably what you're saying, Jess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's difficult. I mean, I think the the thing to recognise as well is obviously with the living wage yes. um, coming in. You know, that is a big step towards um, making sure people are paid more. But unfortunately, what we're sometimes seeing is if if that means if a package isn't increased to reflect that, then what actually happens is the worker is getting paid more, um, but per hour, but then they're getting their hours reduced potentially. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't disagree with that at all. It's really important, but it's it's looking at everything within the context and unintended consequences, I guess, sometimes. David? Uh, 
Uh, Chair, I'm surprised a little bit around about the comment around about hours getting reduced as a consequence of the salary going up. And the reason for that is because the Scottish Government has actually made available uh, in the last couple of years uh, a resource with which to fund the, the, the increase to Scottish living wage. So it shouldn't have made that impact or had that impact. Um, I, I actually think, though, there is, uh, that, that we shouldn't shy away from the fact that it might actually be OK for there to be less paid person time going into somebody's life if things like uh, technology enabled care uh, for instance were able to be used in a constructive way to provide different type of overnight care support to uh, individuals for instance something that we're going to have to address anyway as a consequence of decisions made in a different part of the system around about sleepovers uh, and the payment of uh, hourly rates to that so we are going to have to do things differently I, I think that's consistent with actually actually striving uh, for an outcomes-based approach uh, in relation to helping people to live, live independently, helping people to move on uh, with their lives, regardless of levels of ability. The key to it, of course, is uh, by to make sure that we're actually doing that jointly and in a co-produced way, rather than actually just putting it in place. Uh, and that's where that dialogue and that time needs to, to be given uh, the, the capacity to do that. Ian Smith. I think the concern that uh, we have is that, um, that the money which is the Scottish Government keeps uh, telling us has gone into supporting so increased social care is actually primarily money which is there to support the living wage increase, and it doesn't actually increase this, the sum total of social care that's available. Uh, it, 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 I mean, we're not against a, uh, the living wage increase, obviously, um, but I'm very concerned about the comment that David just made because he seemed to be suggesting that because of the, the overnight care. Um, um, wage rulings that they may have to look at how you provide overnight care and that sounds like a resource based approach rather than uh, what is right I mean, I'm not saying that telecare might not be appropriate for some people might actually be better for some people but if it's done on the basis that actually we've got to save money because we've actually had this uh, ruling which says we've got to pay people to do the overnight care then that is not a good approach and I hope that's not what he's suggesting is going to happen let me not answer for him, but let me tell you, it's already happening. It does not necessarily in your local authority, but in others. Well, David? I, I don't think we can separate out uh, the resource available to us from the, the need to deliver services. And, and our responsibility uh, as leaders is about making sure that uh, we, we maximise on the available resource to us. So if there is a ruling that comes uh, from uh, the um, HMRC in relation to sleepovers, that has a, an a impact on Glasgow City of increasing the budget immediately by £5 million just to pay for that difference in sleepovers, uh, then I have a responsibility to uh, look at how can we absorb that additional potential spend in different ways so that it doesn't negatively impact on budgets elsewhere. Uh, that's my responsibility. Uh, and, and I think that's OK to do that, because actually that's around about engaging in a discussion and a dialogue. The other thing, and it does link to the chair, sorry, it does link to the question here around about uh, recruitment. Uh, the, the, the necessarily, the sleepover decision has created itself a workforce impact on uh, provider organisations. Because the person who was doing the sleepover historically and traditionally was somebody who did a, a back shift, slept over and did the early shift. That person can't now do that sleepover. So recruitment, there are recruitment issues uh, in, in relation to being able to provide that cover, even if we had the money available to us just to pay it as a sleepover. So we have to have, we've got a responsibility to look at how we can we, we, move we could that spend, on. We could spend the next hour talking about sleepovers and whether resource should come from the Scottish Government to local authorities to help with some of that. Um, I'm not going to go there, OK, because this would be a whole other discussion, um, but, but this is something that will exercise people going forward. Um, next week, we have the Scottish Government and COSLA. You've helpfully suggested areas that we can question them on. Um, I'm not going to extend the meeting to explore some of them with you now but I would be grateful if you think of something as you're walking out the door or when you get back to your desk email us because we will be interested in putting your points both to the government and to COSLA can I thank each and every one of you for coming today it's been a really productive session and as I say we could have gone on for longer but uh, discipline means that we're not going to because we have first minister's questions shortly <laughs> so thank you very much for your attendance I now move the committee into private session